Number one, don't wait. Even though people might be thinking, oh my goodness, the market's going up and up and up. I literally thought it should have crashed back in 2018. I was like, man, the prices are really high now, but it just keeps going up. The reason why I say don't wait now, because there, like you said, Bo, there are still great deals out there. In fact, last month, one of my students literally bought four, closed on four properties with none of his own money and got at least 20% equity capture in every single one of those properties. Welcome to the Investor Financing Podcast, where we interview real estate investors and lenders so you can learn all the secrets to getting your projects funded and scale your portfolio. And now, your host, Bo Eckstein. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. And sorry, I haven't been as consistent because I've been super busy, um, but uh, we're going to go back to trying to get three or four out a week if that's possible but uh today we have a very special guest and uh what resonates with our guest today is that um a lot of people i talk to that call in for financing different investors or want to be investors you know everybody everybody has pretty much the same goal how can i get reoccurring revenue how can i replace my w-2 job and we're going to dive deep into this and i think it's i think this is going to be most of the People listening are probably in this boat where they're saying, okay, let's get rid of the W-2. I have some friends that don't need to be W-2 and they're like, I can't quit my job. It's like, you already, have, you already replaced your income with passive income. Let's just do it. But anyways, uh, please welcome Dustin Heiner to the show. He's a rental property expert and founder of masterpassiveincome.com. And that's one heck of a domain name right there, masterpassiveincome.com. All right. Being successfully unemployed at 37 years old by investing in real estate and rental properties, he is now on a mission to help everyone to quit their job and never have a job again. He also helps his students build successful real estate investing business, businesses all over the country. All right, Dustin, welcome to the show. And uh, why don't we just quickly dive in and talk to us prior to you quitting your job. How'd you get into real estate and what steps did you take to get where you could finally uh, hand in your termination letter, res re resignation letter rather. Hey Bo, thanks for having me on the show. I'm really excited to share this. So yeah, I love real estate. I love, well, I love rental properties is what it is. I don't like flipping is great. Wholesaling is great. Like all the other types of things are fantastic, but I literally love working one time, buying one house and then literally not doing a thing after that. In fact, I only work 30 minutes, not a day, not a week, 30 minutes a month. And it's just getting my statement from my property manager, making sure everything looks so okay. And then setting it aside. So I love having an automatic business where I literally don't do anything. In fact, in 2017, I went to Japan for six weeks with my family, drove 2000 miles around the entire island of Japan. Uh, this is right after I quit my job, which I'll get into in just a second. Uh, 2018, we went through Europe, 11 different countries, six week trip. And 2019, we went from Florida, drove all the way up to New York on a four week trip. All the while, I literally didn't even think about my real estate. I didn't think about anything because I had other people doing the work for me. Now, when I first got started, it was back in 2006, and I started buying one property, and then I, I kind of got a little lack today's goal on it. And I'll give you a little bit of story what really catapulted me into now I have 30 plus properties. I, I literally don't need to work. I just do these interviews and uh, be on, have my own podcast and everything because it's fun. I have time to do it. So what happened was, when my wife had our fourth child, we have four kids, my fourth child was born and I went on to paternity leave. That's where the dad stays home with the mom, takes care of the baby, as well as bonds with the baby and everything like that. And I'm working a regular job. I work for the county government in uh, one of the counties in California. And I go on paternity leave, but then I come back. And on a Friday, like this, that same week, I come back on a Friday at 3.30 in the afternoon, I get a call from my boss's, boss's, boss's secretary, like the top dog says, hey, Dustin, would you please come to the boss's office? And I say, sure. And I hang up the phone and then I pause for a second. And I think, what could they be calling me for? I haven't done anything bad that I know of. I don't know if did anything good. What could they be calling? This is unnormal or out of the usual. And so I, start, I sat there for a second. I thought, well, what has happened recently? And I remembered before I went on paternity leave, there was some rumors about a month or two ago prior to that that there was possible layoffs because the department was running out of money and, or they didn't have the money for their budget. I said, no, I have so much secure security. Like I have seniority. I have, I've been working there for 10, 12, 13 years, however long it was. I've been working. I do a great job. There's no way I can get laid off. 
Then I get up and I start walking down the hall. As I walk down the hall, it's not a very long hall, but every single step gets like it's further and further away. My feet become like lead bricks because it starts to weigh on me. What if this is a time that I actually lose my job? I just had our fourth, or my wife had our fourth kid. What am I going to do? And I start taking every single step. And eventually, the short hallway, it took forever, but it seemed like, but I round the corner to my boss's office. His door is closed. And I look at his secretary and she looks at me and sheepishly, she says, Dustin, would you please have a seat? And so I say, yeah. And I, I take a seat and she's consoling me with her eyes, kind of grinning because she knows everything that's going on. I have zero clue of what's going on. So I sit there and it's the way the world starts to get on my shoulders. And then I start to think to myself, all this time working here, I've been working this, you know, climbing the ladder to try to get good seniority and basically have security here. And is this all going to be taken away from me? And then I started realizing or started to think, what does that make me like? Does that make me a failure as a husband? Does that make me a failure as a father, even as a man providing for his family? Say, oh my goodness. And then it started weighing on me so much that my hands got all clammy. My forehead started to sweat. And then the door opens to my boss's office and out walks a lady with a piece of paper in her hand. She's noticeably distraught. Like her world's been rocked, but she's not crying. But you can tell something happened has been terrible. My boss ushered me into his office. Lo and behold, I actually get laid off. Remember, this is the government. Who gets laid off or fired from the government? But I did. So if anybody can get laid off, and I did, you can too. So I take my layoff notice and I walk down back down that hall. I get to my office and I sit down. And then I realize two things. Number one, I need to get a job to provide for my family. I absolutely need to do that. And my one property isn't enough to provide for us. So I need to get another job. So I was really blessed, praise the Lord, to get another job. The Fresno County Sheriff's Office worked there for a number of years, great job. And so I didn't even actually get laid off. It was just complete transfer. So I was really blessed that they had a position. The second thing that I remember that I, I hope every listener would actually grab onto, I needed to make sure that I never, ever let this happen to me again. Never, ever allow somebody to have so much control over my life, whether I could take care of my family, provide the roof over our heads, feed us and all that sort of stuff. I need to make sure that never happened again. And so what I decided at that point, literally sitting there in that desk, said, no longer will I ever tell somebody when they ask me, hey, Dustin, what do you do? Usually I'd say, I work for the county government. I do IT work, you know, technology work for the county government. I said, no longer will I ever say that again. I'm, instead of people asking me that, and I'm thinking about my job, I'm going to tell them what I value in myself. So I then point forward. I said, I am an investor. It might so happen that I make the majority of my money or all my money from my job. That's now my part-time job. What I identify as, or my value is, is an investor. And as I started telling every single person doing that I did that. And so everybody listening to this, everybody needs to realize that your value is so much greater than anybody could ever pay you. And here's the reason why you definitely know this. Your boss is only paying you enough to keep you working without quitting, but not so much money that takes money out of their pocket. You need to realize that your value is so much greater. And I'll round out the story like this. I worked for another, I don't know, four or five years buying property after property because I was told, telling everybody I was an investor. People were giving me, or basically wanting me to buy properties for them or giving me money to invest for them or wanting to rent my properties or everything because I was telling everybody as I was an investor. And after a few more years of buying property after property, after 30 plus properties, I was 37 years old. I said, you know what? I don't need to work here. Like you said in the beginning, I don't need this job. I replaced my income. And at, after everything, I'll round it out by saying this. You remember that walk that I took down the hallway to my boss's office where my feet felt like lead bricks? Well, I went to my, my new boss's office. Great job. Remember, it was a great job and everything. But I didn't need it anymore. I said, boss, I'm done. And I left the office, walked to my car. And it's a, about a mile walk because I work in downtown Fresno. So I didn't want to pay for parking. So I was parking really far away. That walk was the best walk I've ever taken. I've done it thousands of times, but I felt like I was walking on clouds because I knew I would never, ever have to work a job again because of my real estate and the passive income business that I created will literally take care of us for the rest of our lives. That's a great story. I love it. So let's kind of unpack this a little bit. So um, I, I, like I said earlier, I get calls and people are like, you know, th their goal is not to have a W-2 job. Um, but I also think that it's important for people that view this at some point or listen to it on a, on a podcast is that, 
you, you have to have a plan, right? Like you can't just go quit your job and you have one rental property. Okay. You're not probably not going to make it unless you're doing some wholesaling and you have some skill set there, but that's a really stressful way to do it. So, you know, I, I guess my advice for these people is you got to wait, you got to be strategic about it. You got to know in the back of your mind that by this, you know, you set the date a few years out and, and then you, you backtrack and figure out, okay, how many properties, how many doors, What's the cash flow look like so I can get to that day where I can walk in and give my, because also right now too, people that are listening is I'm in the financing realm and it's much easier to get loans if you have a W-2. Like once you go self-employed, it's like, even if you have five times the amount of money in your bank account, it's still like 10 times harder to get a loan. It just does not make sense. So in the beginning, I'm assuming that you know, your advice is, is is similar where like leverage what you have, use your W-2 income. You know, you're going to have to like, work, you're going to have two jobs essentially for a few years, but at some point in a, in a couple short years, depending on, you know, the market, where you're investing, what you're buying, things like how good you are as an investor, right? Not everybody that goes out is able to find really good cash flowing deals, right? So it's a, it's a skill set. You, I mean, it's not rocket science, but you still need to have a skills to get these good cash flowing properties. So What's your advice like to set this plan up and like, how would you go about doing it again? I mean, also you probably were doing it in an opportune time. Um, not that it's not opportune right now, but we've had a huge run up, right? Like you were probably buying, when you started running, buying prop. Um, first of all, I'm also curious where you're buying, what, you know, how you did it, right? How you leveraged and were you buying out of state? Were you buying local? Let's kind of unpack all that. And that was about 10 questions. So you probably didn't remember. <laughs> I could definitely jump into all that. So I'll, I'll start with where I'm buying. Yeah. So California is where I was living. Now I moved to Phoenix since then, which was many years ago when I first started investing. That was in 2006, before the crash. People were saying, you better buy now or you're never going to be able to buy. Well, we realized that was wrong. And they're saying that now, but long story short, I started buying Ohio and then Texas and then Arizona. So that's where I invest. And I have students all over the country vesting literally everywhere. But the, I found the Midwest is really, really great for great price points and great rents. Now, to get to your first part of your question, which was how do you actually be able to you know, quit that nine to five? I call it a just over broke job. Because like I said, your boss is only paying you enough just to keep you working. And so you're working that just over broke job. Now, what you really need to do is like you said, Bo, you're right on. You want to figure and backtrack, figure where you want to need, need to be. Like, I knew what my expenses needed to be to pay for. I need to have 40, I think like $4,200 a month that I needed to be able to make that would replace my income because those were my expenses. And then I also want to make sure I made more money to buy more properties. So here's what I did. And this is what I tell all my students. I have students that have quit their job uh, like within two to four years. Now they're hard workers and they buy, find properties and I show them how to do that. But what you do is you figure out how much you can buy every single property for in banking passive income. So I suggest if you're going to buy any properties for a rental property, do not make less than $250 a month in passive income. Now, some properties, I literally make six or seven or $800 a month in passive income, but the minimum is $250. Now, if you realize $250, that in one year is $3,000. That's an extra $3,000. That's fantastic. And if you had 10 properties, then you'll have $2,500 a month. That's $30,000 a year. If you have 20 properties, that'd be $60,000 a year. And it just keeps going up. And remember, that's the bare minimum. And so here's what you do in order to do that. You calculate all of your expenses. It's very, very simple. I'm not that smart. So everybody, Bo, I know everybody listening to this is so much smarter than me, but it's literally just addition, subtraction, and a little bit of multiplication. So you add up all your expenses, very fixed, like a mortgage, um, your, your taxes, your insurance, property manager fees, all that sort of stuff. You add all those up and you figure out how much you could rent it for. Let's say it's $1,300. You get, make sure your expenses are going to be less than that. And I suggest $250 is the minimum. But let's say your expenses are $1,000, including whatever you do to finance the property, $1,000. But you make $1,300 in rent. That difference is $300. That's passive income that you put in your pocket. And then you just figure out how to actually multiply that out scale the business, which I'll get to in just a second, how you talk about financing completely. Absolutely. I love financing. But here's the thing that we also need to realize as we are figuring out all these expenses, you might be thinking, oh my goodness, that's a lot of money for all these expenses, but I don't pay my taxes. I don't pay my insurance. I don't pay my property managers. I don't pay my mortgage. I don't pay any of that stuff. My tenants pay for every bit of that. Now I happen to funnel the money but they give me that money for renting and I make sure those are paid. And 
the $250 and more is on top of that. So what I did when I bought my first property, I knew I needed to buy a property that made me $250 or more every single month. And so what I did was I took our, like my wife and I just got married. It was like they, two or three months later, I said, hey babe, I really wanna buy real estate. I wanna take all of our savings. In fact, it was her savings because I was never taught to save. She was, so we had like 15 grand. And so that $15,000, I bought our first property with it. And then after about six months, I realized, you know what? I can actually recycle this money. So I refinanced the property pulled that cash hat back out, bought another property, still owned that first one that was still making me to a minimum of $250 a month, bought that second property. Then I realized, hey, why can't I do that all over again? Then recycled that money, refinanced that property, pulled out that money and equity, and then bought two more properties. And I literally took that $15,000 and recycled it over and over and over again. So when you think about financing, see a lot of people, when they invest in real estate, they think they're is very few ways to invest. Like you find a realtor and a mortgage broker, you put them together and you buy a property. Well, that's just one. Like there, there's private money, there's hard money, there's other types of loans that you get. I've used a credit card. Now it's advanced advanced strategy, so be careful and do that. I've used a credit card to buy properties. I've used secure, uh, uh, signature loans. I've used commercial loans, bundle loans, portfolio. I've used all these different ways to build my business, to scale up to where I have thirty over 30 properties now. And all those are passive income producing properties that I literally don't have to work. So in the financing realm, we have, I literally have like at least 15 different strategies that I teach all my students in order to get a uh, financing for, to buy a property. There are so many ways. And basically for me, the way I look at financing for a property, it's a tool, like all these 15 different ways to actually get money to buy a property. It's a tool that we use to buy that property and we figure out whichever tool works. It could be a regular commercial, or commercial, uh, sorry, commercial, uh, a conventional loan. It could be a commercial loan. It could be private money. It could be hard money, whatever it might be. We just figure out how to get it to work. And so that's how I built my business, bought one property after that. I just kept rolling that back into us. So mortgage brokers were my favorite people because they may help, may help me make so much more money. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And so, so you're, you're a fan of the Midwest. I own some properties in uh, Indiana, so I'm pretty close to you in Ohio. And yeah, so the cash flow is great. Um, what are you? What are you looking for? Are you mostly buying single families or duplexes? Is it, are you looking for like the three bedroom, two bath, 1,800, 1,600 square foot? I mean, because what I dealt with is a lot of the stock housing stock I own in Indiana is so old. Uh, so that's probably the one negative I would say is that even if you do a remodel. Are you doing are you doing value add plays? Are you mostly were you were you trying to kind of burr the properties? So you're trying to like buy it, you know, go in with some rehab and then it's gonna appraise for X and pull your money back out and keep on doing that. Is that kind of the strategy, or are you just finding good rentals off the bat that you didn't have to do much work for? <laughs> What would you say to your business saving money and accelerating growth? More than ever, as a business operator, using the resources that you have wisely means not overpaying for those vital business expenses that keep your company moving forward. But ensuring that you're optimizing your savings across every expense category can be a daunting task. That's where our optimization solution can help. It's based on solutions by entrepreneurs and business operators, people like you. We recognize the optimization challenges businesses face because we face them ourselves. That's why we built a platform around our experience that data and benchmarking are the only ways to truly know that what you are paying is what you should be. How do we know that? Because we already built a data-driven technology business around true big data modeling and benchmarking, saving thousands of clients more than $150 million. Now we've applied that same experience to our unique solution, amassing trillions of dollars of expense data from millions of businesses, benchmarking every expense category. This gives us the insights to identify your best possible rates. And with your assistance, we will implement them at no risk or cost and without adversely impacting your existing vendor relationships. But that's not where our solution stops. We'll continue to benchmark your expenses against our $6 trillion data lake to continually find new savings opportunities and areas for expense optimization. On top of that, our work is performed on a contingency basis. So if we can't save you money, you don't owe us a cent. You already have plenty of responsibilities on your plate. And let's face it, scouring through your general ledger to uncover possible opportunities where you could save money is a painful and time-consuming chore. 
This often falls to the bottom of your endless to-do list as you try to keep your organization growing. All we need to begin is a general ledger report from any accounting software. Within a few days, we'll present you with a savings analysis for your review. Next, we'll handle all the negotiations on your behalf. After that, we'll begin performing monthly compliance and optimization audits, so you'll never have to think about overpaying in any expense category again. So call or email today, and we'll help you analyze your expenses, recognize your savings, and optimize your business so you can maximize your company's potential. So I'm an investor, and as investors, we make money in six different ways when we buy a property, and the value add exactly is what you're talking about. Let me quickly go over the six different ways that I make money when I buy one rental property. Obviously, a passive income. I literally just talked about that. It's so fantastic. I love that. Another one is basically equity capture, like you said, value add. I'm an investor, so I know how to buy properties for less than their the actual value is, negotiating and putting many offers on many properties and eventually getting one where I get good equity. So I capture equity. Another one is forced appreciation. I make sure that I could fix up the property, not spending $100,000, but maybe spending $20,000 to make it worth forty dollars or $50,000 more than it's worth. That's another one. Market appreciation, we know it automatically goes up just over time with inflation, all that sort of stuff. Another one is tax benefits. You own one rental property, you get all the tax benefits and depreciation is amazing. I love depreciation. If you learn one thing, depreciation is fantastic. The last one is mortgage buy down. That's where your tenant, like I said, your tenants can be paying your principal and your interest. And so all those ways, I'm literally making money hand over fist. Now, when you're talking about buying it with a value add, absolutely, I'm doing that. But my sole focus is having as little money come out of my pocket every single month or just to buy the property and as much as I can in passive income. Let me give you an example of what that looks like. I am not going to buy a house that somebody's going to be selling for $400,000 and only make $250 a month. Imagine if you had the tenant move out one month and you have to float the mortgage, that $400,000 mortgage for one month, let alone many months, that's going to be a $2,000 payment. That whole passive income is going to be eaten up really, really fast. So what I look for, and like we said, three bedroom, two bath, 1,600 is a little higher. I like 1,200 to 1,400, you know, 1,600, 1,800 square feet to 2,000 square feet. That's that many more walls to paint, electrical outlets, bathrooms, all that. I, that's so much more expenses. I try to keep it similar or very small. I just want people to, to really stay in their property in a long time. And so with the properties that I look for, three bedroom, two bath, they're going to hopefully be 1,200 to 1,400 square feet, and I'm going to be able to buy them for a relatively lower amount, but then I have a higher rent. I'll give you an example. Um, I have a student that literally just bought a house. I think he paid $80,000 for this house. I think it was, if I remember correctly, in Memphis, and $80,000, and I think he's renting it for like $1,200, and his, I think his passive income is like almost $500 on this property, maybe $450-ish, but we want to look for properties that are lower in price and have higher rents so we make a passive income. But your point is very valid. You're buying older homes. And obviously back then, or back over there in the, in the uh, Midwest, and especially in the East, you're gonna have a lot older homes. I have some homes that are literally built in the 1900s, like 1900, that, that's not like the round year, like literally 1900. And I still own them, they're still great properties. I just know that I'm gonna have to put more money into it so that I buy it for a lot less because there's more money going to. So there's a lot of thought processing going through all this, but we make sure we capture equity, we have forced appreciation, we make passive income in everything, every way that we make money. Yeah, no, that 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 is is it makes sense to me. And I think that's a good strategy. When you're buying older houses, you just have a little bit bigger reserve. You know, your numbers have to work, right? So instead of maybe putting two hundred fifty dollars in reserves, maybe it's a three hundred fifty dollar. And does that does that still pay you two fifty per month, right? And and that's really kind of padding yourself for the unexpected, because yeah, it does, it, it does hurt when all of a sudden you go, oh, I didn't know I had to replace a a heater, or you know, that's going to be four grand. Then you're right, your cash flow is gone. But yeah, real estate is such a powerful tool from the appreciation, depreciation, mortgage, you know your tenant paying the mortgage. I mean, there's no better, I think, overall financial 
instrument out there um, to, at all, right? For the average person to create extreme wealth and, and real estate's something you can leverage and it's, and it's everybody needs a place to live. So now, what are your thoughts now kind of like with the craziness of the market, uh, with the run up, even in the Midwest, now we're seeing huge appreciation. I just sold one of my properties and it's gone up a lot in value, right? So what's, what's kind of your strategy and thought process? I mean, now I would say in, in my book, it's probably not the time to be super aggressive, but also don't, don't get bashful because there's going to be a lot of deals that are coming and there's a lot of people that are hurting, uh, which you can help them, right? It's not about trying to get, steal everybody's house, but at the end of the day, we, we, we solve problems. So what's your, your mindset going forward? Where are you positioning your students? Like what, what kind of advice are you giving them? And, and what, what, are you, what advice are you taking for yourself? Because you're still buying and selling real estate. Number one, don't wait. Even though people might be thinking, oh my goodness, the market's going up and up and up. I literally thought it should have crashed back in 2018. I was like, man, the prices are really high. Now this just keeps going up. The reason why I say don't wait now, because there, like you said, Bo, there are still great deals out there. In fact, last month, one of my students literally bought four, closed on four properties with none of his own money and got at least 20% equity capture in every single one of those properties. He's doing a phenomenal job. And that's literally four properties. So that's in, well, right now it's with September. And so it was in August of 2020, 2021 that he literally did that. So People might be thinking you can't buy. Yes, you can get great deals, but you need to know how to do it. So when you're thinking about what you're going to be, where you're going to be buying and how you're going to be buying, what I suggest is what you want to do is you want to build the business first. Now, what people are going to say, like somebody that's actually going to be uh, telling you how to invest in real estate, they're going to say this, and I think it's backwards. They're going to tell you, find a good area to the country to invest and then find a good property. Then you make sure you run the numbers, make sure you're making passive income, capture equity, all that sort of stuff. Then you find somebody to fix it up. Then you find a property manager. Then you find somebody to rent the property. Well, in my mind, that's, that's almost backwards. In fact, what I tell everybody, we need to build the business first. And thinking about, and I'll get to that in just a second, all the areas that we you know, the country to invest, we know that we're going to be making money on every single property because we build a business that has experts in that area giving us wise information. I'll give you an example of what that plays out like. Now, everybody knows what a convenience store is, like a gas station, you know, candy bars and sodas and all that sort of stuff. If you're going to start your own convenience store, you're not going to just lease a place, open the doors and put a box of candy bars in there and a six pack of soda and hope to run a business. In fact, you go out of business in like two seconds. No, before you do any of that, you're going to get the gondolas, which are the shelving units. You're going to get countertops, fountain machines. You're going to get countertops for the cash registers, employees, bank accounts, all that sort of stuff before you buy any inventory. And then once every, your entire business is built, then you put inventory in your business. Same thing with real estate. Every single area of the country that I invest, my students invest, and we all invest, we make sure we build the business first. And in doing that, every piece of property that we buy is a piece of inventory that goes into our business. Because everybody else is going to tell you that one property, that property is your business. No, 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 no. That property is my inventory. That can come and go. I can, like you said, you make, hey, I can make a lot of money selling it. It's just a piece of inventory. I'll sell it. So what we do is we find the right property managers, realtors, wholesalers, inspectors, contractors, like literally every single person in the business, they're experts in the area. So when you're thinking about where should I invest, like in Midwest, how much it should be valued? Is it the right home to buy? Can I actually have somebody rent it and not have, you know, somebody murdered right across the street? Your experts in the area, your property managers are going to be the ones to tell you, hey, I'm not going to manage this property for you because it's a really bad area. That should probably be clue. You should not buy that property. And so the people that find properties that are realtors, oh, it's a great deal. Jump on it. If you can't find a property manager to manage the property, then you are out of luck. And so what we do is we build the business first. And in building the business first, what we're going to see right now, the markets, like you were asking, Bo, markets going up. It's been going up. But here's the thing. I make money, my students make money in an up, down, or sideways market. I, the properties I bought in 2006, I still own, and I made money every single month from the beginning when I owned it to now, and the value did drop. Of course, the value did drop, but now it's above and way above where I, it went down to and where I bought it from. So every single month, I made money in passive income. I started, like I said, in 2006, before the crash. The crash happened. I gobbled up as many properties as I could to help people. In fact, banks were just, they needed to get rid of them. So I was making, making a lot of money. So right now, do not wait because 
we don't know when, if there's going to be a correction or if there's going to be a crash. We have no idea. But there are fantastic deals out there everywhere. You just need to know how to find them, how to negotiate to where you can get it to be a good deal, and how to make sure it's making passive income. But first, build the business. I can't say enough. Build the business, make $250 a month in passive income, and then scale your business from there. That's great. And so, so kind of my takeaway is, is it's really not necessarily the market. It's, it's really building the business because there's a lot of good markets in the Midwest. And as long as you build the business right and you have the right team, it's really not about, you know, well, obviously if you don't want a one, one pony town where there's only one company and if they go out, Absolutely the whole company right. goes out. But, but if it's a diverse economy, which a lot of those markets are, and, you know, you, you can build a business anywhere. Because sometimes I, you know, I'm playing around looking at all these different markets. I'm like, you, we don't even realize, when you really think about how big just the US, US is, right? It's huge. There's a couple hundred million people. And just think about how many opportunities. And you're right. If you're buying right, and especially right now with the cost of borrowing so cheap, even if, you're, oh, yeah. even if you're borrowing hard money, it's still cheap compared to, it used to be 12 and 13, 14%. Now you can get like 8% money or even sometimes a little bit lower on fix and flip loans. So it's, it's, it's an, yeah, it's an opportune time. And I think, I guess it's, it's really just the people that have the inside and have the connections to get these deals, right. Or they are extremely good marketers, but really, if you have that, that good broker in the market that's sending you off market deals and that they're, they're his or her pocket listings. So that's essentially what you're doing. You're building the teams in those different select markets. And then, then it's, 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 you know, it's also strength in numbers too. It sounds like that if you're going in there with a few of your students, it's not just you and your, your three or four properties or two properties in the market. You have, maybe there's 10 or 15 people that are collectively buying in that area. So you have a little bit more weight with the property manager, right? That, that always, like, if I'm buying a property in Indiana, and she only manages my two or three properties. I'm not a big fish with her, but if there was 20 of me, right, doing the same thing, I think I think that's another way to, to look at it too. It's just like, you know, yeah, I always tell people if buying in the Midwest is great. I love, I bought a lot of inexpensive houses that have great cash flow. But I said, like, you just gotta know you have to, you have to know that you're gonna have to do, you know, 20 or 30 of these doors, houses to get your cash flow. If you want to get that nine or 10 net cash passive income a month, it's about that at 250 a door or whatever. So that's good. So it's like you can program. So if, if we, if you got a good nugget out of today, you don't buy anything less than 250 net per door, how many doors you need to replace your income. And then maybe even wait a little bit longer. And then you quit your job. Maybe you get to 120% of your monthly W-2 and then you can quit your job. But in the meantime, you're using your W-2 to get bank financing, to leverage, to figure out, you know, as Dustin was saying, there's six or seven different, you know, there's have all these tools in your tool belt. So you have a solution. Maybe there's seller finance. Maybe you can lease the buy. I mean, master lease. I mean, there's so many ways to, to structure deals and get cash flow too. So that's pretty awesome. So what are your, what are your plans in the next what are you, are you growing, you know, are you looking for, seems like now you're at a position where you can really help people. So you, what, what are you and your students kind of positioning for, for the next 12, 24 months? What do you, do you guys do live events? Are you kind of an online mastermind? How does that all look like? Yeah, I definitely have it's mo mostly online mastermind. I haven't done any live events. And the reason why I found that online working together, so I have, group coaching where it's called the real estate wealth builders where everybody we all network together I, I do group coaching with them we're all in there we're passing along deals you know we're helping each other with financing all that sort of stuff and what's interesting because you know you think about the market way it's at where it's at right now if i would have told people back in 2018 just wait until the market crashes well there are so many students like i literally have uh, uh two or three students right now that should be quitting their job in the next six months if not less than that because they started investing in 2019 now, if I would have stopped in 2018 and not tell anybody and not help anybody, they would not be where they are now. And they're literally having five or $6,000 a month in passive income. But it's because of all the work that they built in to their businesses and the structure that I help them with master passive income and all the networking and all the, the group coaching that we have. And so, yeah, so everything that we have at master passive income, I literally, like I have a podcast called master passive income, but it's literally just me, just my own content, literally teaching people these steps, how to invest, because what's interesting, 
Bo, is I can teach anybody how to invest in real estate, but I cannot get them over that hurdle in their own mind to realize that they can do it. And it takes so much like free YouTube videos, free podcasts, free articles, like free all free stuff in order for them to realize this is possible. Hey, Dustin's just a normal guy. He's just a regular guy. That's a little bit like next door neighbor. Then if he can do it, I can do it. And so that's my goal is I want to see as many people invest. Now, I personally, I keep buying properties. Whenever a good deal comes up, heck yeah. In fact, I have wholesalers sending me deals all the time. Wholesalers, other investors, other property managers. Like I get deals coming to me all the time. When I see a good deal, of course I buy it. But because I have the business set up where everybody's sending me properties, I literally don't need to work. I just say, okay, I like that one. Property manager or no, realtor, help me buy this. Property manager, get on it. Literally one or two hours of my own time. And then I buy the property. But right now I'm focused on helping as many people as possible to literally change their life. I have students that have paid me money in the past. I showed them how to invest in real estate. Now they said, Dustin, I love your vision. I literally want to work for you for free. I'll manage your social media accounts. Like I'll do that. I have one person that's handling all the phone calls and just for free because they saw the vision and they've, they've changed their life. They said, you know what? I just want to give back too. Like you quit your job, then please come right on. So that's the vision for Master Passive Income is just help as many people as possible. That's awesome. I love it. Is that like Powell on the back on your TV screen with your family? Or Close. So that is, this is in Grand Canyon's the Horseshoe Bend. So there's a bend in the, it's just amazing view. If you could ever see it, just look up, type up Horseshoe Bend, Grand Canyon. You'll see the picture of it um, in like an aerial view. It's amazing. Isn't that, don't they have like something similar in like Powell? Cause that's like, it's on the Utah. I don't know. I, I just, it's like a five hour drive from me here in Las Vegas. And it's, it looks like that kind of, but I don't know. But anyways, it's it's, uh, it's all a part of the Grand Canyon, like the the the, the river that runs through as it was the Colorado River or something. But it's all very very similar, so it looks very very similar yeah. all the way through. I uh, yeah, I was uh, from California too. I used to uh, I grew up in um, Walnut Creek. Um, so you're I was uh, outside of San Francisco. It sounds like you're originally from the Fresno Fresno area. Fresno area. Yep. And uh, relocated similar, except you're in Arizona. I'm in, I'm in Las Vegas, and but uh, I, I, Arizona would be a pretty fun place to live too. I could, I could see myself live. I like the desert. I think you. I think a lot of I people. I do too. Can, yeah, people go. Oh, it's too hot. I'm like, I, I, I go. I get up in the morning so early, and the mornings in the desert are the most spectacular. Like the skyline, and I, I try to explain it. To I people. agree. Yeah. So what I agree. Doing? I love. I love Arizona, and yeah, it's. it's I'm really blessed to be here. It, it, people say it's hot, but Hey, it's hot other places and I'm fine. We have air conditioning. It's totally fine. <laughs> so what do you do when you're not uh, investing in real estate? I know you got four children and a wife. Uh, you have any other hobbies or activities you like to yeah. do? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, like I said, I literally work 30 minutes a month um, on my real estate and my online business. I jump on, I literally block out like two hours a week to do interviews like this, like with great people like you, Bo. And so other times I literally... I lift weights. I love doing Olympic lifting, like snatch and clean and jerk. I love doing that CrossFit style stuff. And then I golf. Phoenix is the capital of golf. And so like I golf a lot and I just literally hang out with my family, help out my church and everything. Hey, I actually had a thought. So I have a free, I have a real estate investing course that I could give to your audience for free. Would you mind if I gave that to them? Yeah. So what we're going to do too, yeah, you give it now and then I'll also put it in the show notes because most of my viewers actually watch on YouTube. So we'll put the link in the show notes. And, but yeah, go ahead and say what the URL is or the, how they can find it. Yeah. Awesome. So you go to masterpassiveincome.com forward slash free course. It's all one word, masterpassiveincome.com forward slash free course. I will give you my real estate investing course. It'll show you how to find an area of the country and invest, how to make sure you build the business first, scale the business, buy the right properties, making $250 a month, make it an automatic business. So I'll literally give that to you. And also a really quick and easy way. If you're texting, you could text the word rental, R-E-N-T-A-L to 33777. Rental to 33777. And I'll get you my free real estate investing course. Cool. That's so awesome. I really appreciate you joining us. We'll love to have you come back at some point and, and maybe we could do some case studies of some of your houses. So oh, people, that'd be great. Or some of your students' deals. Uh, people love since... Most of the time, I mean, people download and listen on iTunes and stuff, but really people, I think, enjoy the YouTube channel better. And I like the YouTube um, aspect of it better. I just, I don't really care about my, I mean, if people are at the gym, I get it. You, they want to listen, but I'm, people, most people call me and they go, oh, I love watching your YouTube channels and I watch them all the time. So, but anyways, so we're gonna great. Put the, we'll put the show notes underneath um, and thank you so much. Kind of departing 
uh, from from you. What do you what do you do? Uh, what are your, some book recommendations? Are you you listen to books? You read books? Uh, are you are you a big personal development kind of guy, or are you just is it more kind of internal kind of drive, or, or what what keeps you motivated besides obviously your family and everything like that? I definitely learn audibly. So I love listening to audiobooks. So that's like one of my face podcasts, audiobooks, all that sort of stuff. And so I'll give you a, a quick two books. Number one for reg, just overall understanding in, cause I love learning about how to be a better person in general. Um, Richest Man in Babylon is a fantastic book. I love that book cause it, it's a storytelling, but it helps you to understand awesome principles on money and how to be wealthy. So Richest Man in Babylon written by George S. Clausen. Fantastic book. But another book that I'm at currently, I actually physically bought the book. It's called um, uh, YouTube Formula. So I have my own two YouTube channel for Master Passive Income, where it's literally just me teaching people how to invest in real estate. And so I'm learning how to become a better YouTuber because it's it's a whole like its own little ecosystem of how to actually do it right where people don't hit the back button in like two seconds. And so I'm learning how to be, become a better YouTuber, teaching people how to invest in real estate. Yeah, that's great. I, uh, I'll tell you a story about how I learned how powerful YouTube is. I get leads from my lending business every day from YouTube, but, but uh, in 2013, I actually got casted for a house flipping TV show from a YouTube video. And I did 12 episodes. Of, I did 12 episodes of the house flipping show in the Bay area called flip it to win it. And it was, they found me on my, from my YouTube, uh, YouTube video. And then that, that's why I am a fan of YouTube. And what's the second largest that's awesome. search engine uh, is YouTube who owns YouTube, Google. So you know, top two search engines, Google and YouTube. And, and it's, I mean, where else can you get your own TV station? Right. And if you have information, <laughs> if you have information to share, you might as well share it. Right. Like I love, I actually, you know, it's humbling when somebody says like yesterday, it's was like, I love watching your, your stuff on financing because I'm trying to finance this construction of a multifamily property. And I want to, you know, you're giving different explanations. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's our job, right. If we have a little bit of knowledge to help people, right. Obviously, in return, we're going to be helped ourselves. But really, if you have knowledge that you could share, that's the beauty of like the now generation, right? Like we can go and have our podcast. We can have thousands of people watch us. And we put a video out here like this video, for example, right? It's going to go out to the platform. It's going to go to iTunes. It's going to go to Stitcher. You know, there's going to be, I'm not, I don't have a huge fan base. Like some people get millions of views, but it's going to touch, guarantee it's going to touch a bunch of people and people are going to take action for whatever reason. Maybe they go to your free course. Maybe they, you know, become a student of yours because they like you so much. But the fact is, is that somebody's going to, somebody's going to make a big change in their life because of this video. I, and, and really it was just, you know, a few minutes of our time sharing some information. So I appreciate you. And it's great to meet you here on the, on the zoom. And, and um, I'd love to have you come back in the future and any final thoughts or words. Yeah. So Absolutely. Everybody that's, if you listen to this, I want you to know that you absolutely can invest in real estate. A lot of people think, oh, my uncle's brother's best friend had a rental property. They destroyed it. And so I don't want to do it. I don't want to handle those 2 a.m. phone calls. I can literally show you how you can do it to where you don't even take anything. You just get 30 minutes a month to do it. You just need to make sure that you make that shift in your brain to help. Just like I said, when I I got laid off, I got laid off. I had to make that shift in my brain to say, I'm an investor. I'm going to do this. If you make yourself into where you're going to be an investor or whatever it is you're going to be doing, put your full effort in it. And as you're doing that, you're going to realize that you're going to, you have so much more value than anybody can ever pay you. So my, my party thoughts are absolutely, you are more valuable than anybody can pay you. Get out there and make it done. All right. Thank you so much, Dustin. And thanks everyone for watching, listening, or downloading this somewhere now or in the future. We appreciate you and we'll see you on the next show. 